Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here again. And uh, I, uh, indeed, I was asked, did I want to repeat my lectures about health economics and social capital? And I said, well, actually, it'd be more interesting to change the topic a bit. And so my topic is um, going to be uh, all about using economic evaluation or cost effectiveness evidence to inform healthcare decision making. Uh, it's a, a topic that's really, shall we say, close to my heart. I, I'm heavily involved with several organisations. Thank you. Uh, several organisations in England which are in the health sector and use economic information. Uh, most notably, there's a body called NICE, or, or National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And this body, I'll be talking about it in more detail later, but it uh, makes important decisions for the National Health Service in England regarding which technologies will be available for patients or which will not be. But I, my, and I've been involved with that organization since about 2003. So you can see I'm, I love it. Not the organization, I love the, the use of economic information to try and take better decisions. If I didn't like it or support it, I wouldn't still be doing it after all these years. I've also uh, been a, a member of uh, an organization called SABTO, the Safety of Blood, Tissues and Organs. Uh, I did that for about eight years. And that committee was responsible for formulating policy uh, with respect to the safety of uh, blood and blood products and uh, tissues and organs for transplant. And uh, I've also been involved in other organisations. Another one I'll be talking a little bit about later this week is the Joint Committee on Vaccination Immunisations, or JCVI. And again, they utilise health economic information to try and assist them in taking decisions regarding which programmes uh, of immunisation to introduce or which not to introduce. Now, this picture here uh, was just around the corner from my office. I was walking past one day and I spotted it. Uh, and I thought it summed up uh, mm, the, the essence of economic evidence and decision making for healthcare. We're trying to hold on to our money. Healthcare is expensive. There's no shortage of things we could be putting money into in the health sector. Lots and lots of new developments, which is good news. Uh, there's also old things that work. That's good. But while we want to spend, we don't want to spend too much. There's other things we care about in life. So this character is trying to hang on to his heart and his health at the same time, firmly grasping the money. And he's being torn. Uh, actually, literally, he's missing a leg, I think, but I think that was vandalization, vandals or something, rather than uh, the health sector leading to it. Well, I'm, I'm just about to give you an overview of what these six lectures will cover. Uh, in this first lecture, I'm going to look at the the underlying approach uh, of using cost effectiveness information to help decision making. And I'm going to point out a number of the challenges that arise. Then in the first le the lecture this afternoon, I'm going to introduce you to a particular uh, issue in economic evaluation. And that is uh, the issue of being able to model the future what's going to happen to the patients as a result, particularly, of interventions. Then tomorrow morning, I'll move on to 
another important topic, and that is the way we value the time patients spend in different health states. Because many healthcare interventions work by moving patients into a better health state than they otherwise would be in. That's how they work. And so what we're trying to do is compare the time patients will spend in different health states given current treatments or current programs. We want to compare that with the time they'll spend in different health states with a new program or new treatment. And it's not just enough to know how long patients will live in different health states. We need some information on how good or bad that health state is. And so that will be the topic of tomorrow morning's lecture. And the dominant approach in this area is to calculate something called qualies or quality adjusted life years. Uh, the principle there is that while we're very interested in whether patients live or die, we're also very interested in when they survive, the nature of their survival. What sort of, broadly speaking, quality of life do they expect to enjoy? And the quality, quality adjusted life here, is an attempt to combine those two dimensions, changes in survival and changes in the health state that they survive in. Tomorrow afternoon's lecture is going to look at alternatives to the quality because uh, qualies, while very useful, are readily uh, criticised and have their own limitations. And I'll look at the two main approaches that have been suggested as an alternative to the quality. One is to use money to value health outcomes, and the other is to um, look at life satisfaction or well-being. Uh, and there's an area of health economics and broader economics research that's been developed in recent years called happiness research. And it's based on the idea, could we not just measure how happy people are and then we measure the benefit of an intervention by how much we increase happiness? So I'll introduce you to that uh, approach. But I stress the dominant approach Thank you very much, is the calculation of qualities. Here goes. All cross our fingers. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. It's great having assistance. Yeah, so this is just a quick run through. These are the lectures. So, as I say, I'll introduce this dominant approach of looking at the cost per quality gained. And in order to calculate our qualities, we have to be able to model the time individuals spend in different health states. And then we need to be able to value that time that they're spending in different health states. I'll look at alternative approaches to valuing health outcomes in lecture four. And in lecture five, uh, I'm going to keep with economic evaluation, but move it more into the area of public health interventions. And look at particular issues raised when we're looking at public health interventions, as opposed to um, perhaps interventions such as many drug treatments, which are directed at the individual. And then I'm going to finish, uh, it's Friday afternoon, uh, I'm going to finish by take, standing back from all of the detail. There'll be a lot of detail in the next few lectures, but in the last lecture, stand back from the detail and start to look at the broad advantages, but also the limitations of the economic approach. Because it's particularly important that you're aware of both. Uh, economic evaluation is becoming more and more important in a wider range of countries around the world. Clearly, there are groups of decision makers who see advantages in bringing economics and economic evaluation into account when we are making decisions regarding our healthcare priorities. But at the same time, all methods are limited and 
There are many challenges in considering economic information in our decision making. And I want to bring out the challenges as well as the, the strengths. And so that's where we'll get to. And I, I hope you survive. I hope my voice survives. I, uh, I, I don't quite know why my voice is so weak these days, but I, I, had, a, well, I had a health problem mm, last November. And one of the consequences is I seem to, I used to be able to not quite fill a football stadium with my voice, but I used to feel I could project, you know, like an actor. Um, but now my voice um, has lost its power. But I, it's a nice small room, so I, I hope it won't be too much of a problem. If at any point I get too faint, just, you know, encourage me to, to speak louder, yeah? Also, I should say, <coughs> excuse me, throughout, I'm very happy to take comments, questions. We can have discussions around different points. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to repeat things or restate things. Okay, so just uh, feel free. I know it can sometimes feel a bit sort of, you know, you think, oh, I don't get this. Maybe everybody else understands it. And I don't want to own up. I don't want to say, but if you have a problem, be, be aware others probably also have a problem. Okay, so it's specifically in this, in this lecture, I want to look at a number of challenges um, in using cost effectiveness evidence. And one particular issue is what's described as setting the cost effectiveness threshold. Now, if we're measuring cost effectiveness as the cost per quality adjusted life year gained, or cost per additional quality, if that's how we're measuring it, the issue that arises immediately is what additional cost should we be willing to spend to get an additional quality? And that's known as the cost effectiveness threshold. And it's a threshold in the sense that once you've decided how much you're willing to spend to get one more quality, once you've set that limit or threshold, if your analysis suggests a new intervention produces qualities at a much higher cost, it's over the threshold and probably will not get selected, probably will not get funded. In the other direction, if your analysis suggests the cost per quality gained is less than the threshold value, well then you may be quite likely to recommend that particular program or intervention or technology. So setting a threshold is very important. As we'll see, the quality is, while it's a powerful tool, it has limitations and it's trying to capture the health benefit, but arguably, and more so for some conditions than others, arguably, it will fail to really capture the full health benefit of an intervention or a therapy. And so the issue arises, are there ways we could improve on our quality measure to develop a measure that's better able to capture the health benefits? And I'll look at some issues there. Um, one way of approaching it is to recognize that uh, some qualities or quality adjusted life years may be more valuable than others. And I want to consider a set of reasons why that might be the case. Another issue we need to focus on is what I've described here as a tension between cost effectiveness and affordability. And the tension is this, in many healthcare systems, an intervention might appear to be cost effective. In other words, a good use of resources, uh, a relatively low cost way of acquiring additional health benefit. It may appear to be a, a, 
value for money. But that doesn't mean the money isn't there and it's affordable. That, that we then have the money in place, the budgets available to purchase this new technology or therapy. And this is a particularly a problem uh, in low and middle income countries where there may be evidence that the intervention is a good use of resources, but there's no space in the healthcare budget to pay for it. And so we have a tension. And I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit. And the final um, section of this morning's lecture, I'm going to look at a few examples, particularly from England, of different organisations utilising economic information to uh, inform decision making. I'm using England partly because I'm f highly familiar with it, but also England's probably at, at one extreme, probably more than any other country, England is prepared to use economic information to influence its decisions in healthcare. It's not the only country that is, but it's probably at one extreme. Okay. Um, in terms of language, am I going at an all right, uh, sort of okay speed? Um, I know you're in you know, international graduate studies, you do it in English. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, if, if, if I go to, if, if I speed up and you want me to slow down again, let me know. Okay. Right, the cost per additional quality. That's our basic measure of cost effectiveness. Now, there are lots of other measures. I mean, if you were looking at a, uh, a new bisphosphonate in order to prevent fractures of bones and so on, vertebral fractures, hip fractures, you could, of course, look at the cost per fracture prevented. Or um, you could look at interventions and look at cost per additional life year gained. So there are alternatives, but the quality is perhaps the dominant approach. And it's the, it's the dominant approach because in principle, you can use it in lots of different areas of healthcare activity. So it's, you could use it to look at new strategies um, for screening for cancer. You could use qualities to measure outcomes when you're looking at um, new treatments for plaque psoriasis. You could look at new drugs for um, preventing cardiovascular problems such as stroke or myocardial infarction. You could use a quality. In principle, uh, in mental health, you could use qualities as well. I say in principle because it's, it's, it's less obvious how powerful the quality is or how well adapted it is perhaps in mental health. But it can still be used in mental health. It is used, but uh, perhaps the quality is at its greatest strength when the area of healthcare involves a wider range of physical functioning. But I think it's fair to say that even the most enthusiastic advocate of qualities recognizes the limitations of qualities. And in any decision-making context, it's highly unlikely an individual or a committee will want to just make their decision on the basis of cost per quality. So the cost per quality gained is an important aspect of most decisions, but it's surely not our only concern. And so the issue arises, how uh, should we take into account the other factors that we want to influence our decision? And I'll give some examples of that in the latter half of this lecture. Okay, determining the cost effectiveness threshold. As I say, we need to be able to specify a threshold because 
If we're measuring uh, cost effectiveness as cost per quality gained, by itself, that number doesn't really tell us anything. That number can only tell us something uh, when we put it in the context of a cost effectiveness threshold. So for example, in Japan, would 10,000 yen per quality gained be good value? Well, almost certainly. Would 100,000? Yes. Would uh, 20 million yen per quality gained be good value? Um, probably not. Big gap between 100,000 and 20 million. Um, where should the threshold lie? And without a threshold, we just have these numbers that say the cost per quality was such and such, but it's not really um, information that we can find very helpful without some idea as to how much we are willing as an organization or perhaps even as a society to spend to get an additional health benefit. Now there's a number of source, potential sources for cost effectiveness threshold. One approach that's been suggested is to look at past decisions and ask what value is implied by past decisions. So if we look at the things that we've said yes to previously or the things we've said no to previously and we look at their cost effectiveness, their cost per quality gained, could that have an implied threshold? <clears throat> well, certainly this has been done and people have looked at a series of decisions and tried to say what cost effectiveness threshold is implied. But really, it's a rather unsatisfactory approach. It's unsatisfactory because just because in the past we made one decision or a series of decisions that implied a particular cost effectiveness threshold, that doesn't mean it's the right threshold. It doesn't mean it's the right threshold for the future. Also, if somehow in the past we've been able to be consistent, why do we even need a threshold? If, if somehow in the past, without almost thinking about it, we've been able to make the right decision, why, why do we need to formalize it now? And of course, the answer is, well, we haven't in the past. We've made decisions that have implied different thresholds in the past. So that's probably not a very good source. Second um, potential approach for identifying a cost effectiveness threshold is to try and identify society's willingness to pay for additional health benefit. How much is society willing to pay? So for example, in a context such as Japan and certainly such as England, where the healthcare system is predominantly, um, the money is coming from taxation. In such a system as that, how much are taxpayers willing to pay? How much more tax would they be willing to pay in order to get additional health benefits? Now, this approach has been used The estimates cover a really wide range. And maybe it's not surprising because um, if you're asking an individual how much are you willing to pay in order to acquire additional health benefit, that's really quite a tough question for most individuals. They don't think of life that way. A um, particular problem we have in um, in England, if you try and ask someone that question, is they say, I'm not willing to pay anything. I pay taxes. You provide the health care. I expect you to provide the health care because I've paid taxes. I'm not going to say I'm willing to pay so much more for a health benefit. But it's certainly a potential approach. Although, as I say, the actual values that have been generated are all over the place because it's, it's quite, well, well, I'll go into willingness to pay estimates a little bit in the fourth lecture. <clears throat> um, 
Another approach which has really been quite popular, and again, particularly in low middle income countries, is relating the cost effectiveness threshold to per capita gross domestic product, or GDP. And for a number of years, uh, WHO, World Health Organization, were really pushing this approach. And the idea was that if an intervention had, typically in a low middle income country context, it's been cost per DALI, disability adjusted life year, rather than cost per quality. But for our purposes, while they're not the same, they're the same concept. They're a general measure of health benefit. And the cost per DALI that was considered to indicate cost effectiveness was when the cost per DALI was less than three times GDP per capita. Less than three times GDP per capita. And that was deemed cost effective. And if the intervention was at a cost per DALI of less than GDP per capita, it was deemed highly cost effective. Now, more recently, since about 2015, WHO have perhaps recanted on this and have said, oh, that's not what we really meant. Uh, they've not been very pers persuasive in their statements. Um, so I'm quite glad to say, gradually, we're reaching a situation now where people are moving away from the idea of GDP per capita. It was not a helpful concept. In most low-income countries, the range of interventions that we could identify that met those criteria, either three times GDP particularly, or even one times GDP, was really very high. But very few of these interventions subsequently got funded because of this problem I'll be saying more about. The budget is quite small and the list of interventions that appear to meet your threshold for cost effectiveness is quite high. And so uh, many interventions were getting labelled cost effective because of this criterion of one or three times GDP per capita, but it was not meaningful or helpful for decision makers. It's not absolutely obvious why GDP per capita should be an indicator of cost effectiveness. I suppose in one very crude sense, you can see the idea that if GDP per capita is very high, it's a very wealthy country, if you're very wealthy, then you are willing to spend a bit more to get a health benefit. If GDP per capita is very low, you're completely unable to spend these sums of money to get the additional health benefit. So you can see why there's a, 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 a crude relationship, but why on earth one times or three times GDP per capita is, is, is a satisfactory um, guide is beyond me. And so I'm delighted we're moving away from it now. The final approach, I would say, is our primary candidate. And this is the cost per unit of benefit of the services that would be displaced. So rather than some sort of external guide to cost effectiveness, such as three times GDP per capita, what's being asked here is this. If we introduce new, new treatment strategy, a new intervention, what are we going to displace? Now, because all health systems are budget constrained, if we introduce something new, we have to displace something. The money has to come from somewhere. Now, obviously, um, governments can decide to increase taxation 
or governments can decide to spend less on roads and defence and education and more on health. And from time to time, they do make that decision. But at any point in time, if we're considering some new treatment or some new public health program or whatever, we are making that decision with respect to a fixed budget. And if we are going to do new things, we have to give up some other things. And so the suggestion here is that we should look at the cost per unit of benefit that we are among the activities we're giving up. The principle being this, that we don't want to give up activities that have a lower cost per unit of benefit than the new activity. Because if we adopt the new activity, and to pay for it, we give up something that had a lower cost per unit of benefit, we're making ourselves worse off. Our fixed budget is going to produce less benefit. Well, that approach is usable when the new intervention is an alternative to something old. But I'm thinking of, for example, uh, immunity dialysis, which was a completely new intervention. There is nothing that would have replaced mm. when urinary dialysis was first introduced. Right. Um, in that sense, uh, yes, that specific substitution, and there's no, uh, there isn't always uh, identifiable thing that can be displaced. But I was thinking of the budget as a whole. And if we think of our healthcare budget, as we add in more new activities, some activities have to drop out. So it may be that we're going to spend more on cancer drugs, and it's not other cancer treatments that drop out, or cancer screening programs or diagnosis programs, but it's spending on mental health goes down, or um, spending on dermatology goes down. So I, I was thinking not so much in the, we have a specific health problem, and what gets displaced, I'm thinking of the broader health budget. But then you have to think about how much calorie this current budget increases. That's right. That's the challenge. So this is the principle that we want to consider uh, what it is we're having to give up when we adopt new um, activities. And so we need to have an estimate of what's getting displaced and the cost per quality of what's being displaced. Now that's no simple task, but conceptually perhaps it's quite appealing because it means that as we take on board new activities, we're doing it knowing that we're producing more health benefit from our resources. To do the opposite, to take on new activities and for health benefit to shrink as a consequence is very unappealing. My question related to this issue is the relationship between the accept post for a, special, a particular technology and the the overall budget. So, should we consider cost effectivity threshold independent of the overall budget in principle, or we may think about the budget and then determine the threshold? Right. I think that's a, a very um, good question. And slightly anticipating what I'm going to say, but I'll, 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 say, I'll, I'll say it. The problem of affordability and cost effectiveness is a problem because uh, they may not, there's no mechanism to make sure they agree. If they agreed, if everything that was cost effective we could afford, life would be very easy. Now, there's two solutions. 
One is, if we're identifying more things that are cost effective and our budget's not big enough, you could say, well, we need a bigger budget because there are lots of good opportunities for the health service, and it's not just health services, it can be public health interventions as well. There's lot, there might be many opportunities to get additional health benefit. Um, so the argument might be, we should therefore adjust the budget upwards. The other interpretation would be, given our budget, these interventions appear to be cost effective, they appear to be good value for money, but actually they're not, that we've set the threshold too high and we should lower our threshold and as we lower the threshold fewer of these new activities will appear good value fewer new activities will appear cost effective and we could bring the cost effectiveness threshold down sufficiently that affordability and cost effectiveness match again those are the two options uh, there really isn't any other option now um, it's probably easier to adjust the cost effectiveness threshold than it is to be adjusting budgets. But over time, of course, the government might decide we do want to spend more in the health sector because there are these good opportunities, maybe with advancing technology, there are these good opportunities to acquire health benefit that didn't exist before. Uh, it could go the other direction. Um, increasingly, uh, shall we say, we're having to work very hard to get additional health benefit. Um, and we have to be country specific here. Um, in wealthy countries such as Japan and England, we have to work quite hard in terms of new technology to make an appreciable difference to people's health. Not the same at all in poorer countries. Um, We've done all the easy things, if, if you like. Uh, we're left with really tough health problems, which it's great that, you know, this campus, there's research scientists, doctors, clinicians working hard to improve health and find the next new molecular entity or new drug or redesigning programs to be more effective. But it's really quite difficult to find any, um, what we say in English, low-hanging fruit, easy things. The easy things have all been done. Now, in many much poorer countries, there are a lot of easy, basic healthcare interventions that could be done to get the benefit. But in countries like Japan and England, we are getting to a stage where we're having to pay quite a lot for additional benefit. So you could indeed say, well, maybe we're spending too much on healthcare. Uh, it's not a popular viewpoint with politicians, voters, patients, pharmaceutical companies. But, you know, maybe we, we, we just pushed it too far. We should spend on other things. And I believe the actual situation in Japan is like the run option. Actually, the public is determined. And in this case, my question is the relationship between drug pricing and the assessment of cost effectiveness. If, uh, in the case of a new drug, if a pharmaceutical company or the government uh, reduce the price, drug price, then the cost will be lower than the previous spend, and uh, the product may be how to say, uh, mixed the So, how to say, uh, should the assessment of cost effectiveness down, uh, be done independent of drug pricing? Right. That's a very interesting question. Should the assessment of cost effectiveness be done independent of drug pricing. Well, increasingly, the manufacturer is doing an assessment of cost effectiveness and is thinking, what price can I charge? And perhaps people will still buy my product. 
because my new drug works this well, so I can charge this price. Or it works really well, I can charge a higher price. Many governments are then almost doing the reverse. They're saying, well, you tell us and you give us evidence that your drug works this well. Given how we value benefit, as our threshold, the most we'd be willing to pay for your drug is this amount. So that is definitely happening from both sides. It's happening from the sort of governmental third party payer perspective. It's happening from the manufacturer's perspective. And the, the price really is central to the cost effectiveness. It's obviously, or I hope obviously, not the only element because um, particularly in phar pharmaceuticals, there's a lot of other healthcare activity that involves resources as well. Uh, but yes, the price is a, is a major determinant of, of cost effectiveness. And arguably, countries that use cost effectiveness thresholds, that use economic information in their decision making, whether they're going to accept or reject new drugs, arguably they get better prices. Uh, and this is something that, um, I, I don't want to cause offence, but Donald Trump, uh, although maybe he's popular in Japan, I don't know. Uh, anyway, let's not go there. He has become very concerned about drug prices in the United States. And a couple of reports have been, government reports have been issued, one by the Council of Minis um, Economic Council and another by the Department of um, Health arguing that prices are so high in the US because of all these nasty governments elsewhere around the world are driving a really hard bargain with the pharmaceutical industry. And they're saying, we won't buy your product at that price. Now, the, the criticism that the US government is making um, has an element of validity because of course, a very high share of the research and development costs, uh, particularly of new pharmaceuticals, is being borne by the US system. And so the argument is that governments in other countries are uh, what's called free riding, are taking advantage. Uh, they're happy to see the new drugs developed, but they're not paying for the development. And then they're driving the price down in negotiation. Uh, there's a little element of truth in that, but um, uh, anyway, slight aside, but yes, definitely, price, drug pricing and cost effectiveness have to be looked at together. Uh, and it's, it's an important topic, yeah. So I, I get carried away and go off in tangents. You have to stop me. Um, yeah, so as I say, to, just to summarize this bit, the, um, there are a range of sources for cost effectiveness thresholds, but really perhaps the approach that's got most, um, most satisfactory reasoning behind it is this idea, what's the cost per unit of benefit that will be displaced? Because if we keep our, our focus on that, that should ensure that we don't start doing new things that mean we lose health rather than gain health. Right, yeah, so as I said, qualities are not perfect. The, looking at the cost per additional quality gained is also, while interesting, is not a, a perfect way of taking decisions. And so there's quite a lot of interest in asking how can we do it better? And one approach is to use um, qualies, but to recognize that perhaps not all qualies have the same value. Uh, 
and I look at a range of arguments that have been made there. And there's quite a long list here of p p possible dimensions that might lead to a differential valuation. Reasons why some health benefits might be valued differently from others. And I guess top of the list, although this isn't a really an ordered list, but the first one I've got here is probably the lead candidate, the severity of the condition. And the idea is this, a quality, quality just in life here, gained by a patient with a severe condition, uh, by severe condition, perhaps we could say a condition with a very poor prognosis, such a quality might be valued more highly than a quality gained by a patient with a less severe condition. Now, they're both gaining a quality, but maybe we value the gain to one person more highly than another. Now, generally, in most countries, all qualities are being treated pretty much equally. Uh, recently, policy in Norway has changed to explicitly recognize that severity might be important. And so to allow um, for this, and the way they've tried to implement it is by using a higher cost effectiveness threshold when the patient has a particularly poor uh, prognosis. There's also, yeah. Let's, let's say we have a Kali between zero and one. Mm -hmm. Does the first principle mean that a Kali from uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 is, should be value bigger than the Kali from 0 0.9 to 1.0? Okay, so, <clears throat> yeah, the, I'll just clear one minor confusion or potential confusion first of all. The quality has two dimensions. It has a, a score, uh, that's the QA, the quality adjustment, and it has the life year bit, the survival, the time dimension. So, um, so a quality is um, almost, almost a physical unit. What you're talking about is the quality adjustment part of it. So you're saying, suppose um, a patient is at some level 0.2, and we can move them up to 0.3. Should that not be m worth more than another patient being moved from 0.8 to 0.9? Right. Uh, that is one dimension of this. The idea that if somebody's already in quite good health, if they're at 0.8, Moving them to point 0.9, well, that's good, but it's not very important for them. Whereas somebody in very poor health, let's say point 0.2, moving them the same amount up, point up to point 0.3, is much more significant. Well, I'd say the opposite. Ah, good. so if you cut in the, in the point 0.8 to point 0.9, we've almost got somebody fully healthy. The point 0.2 to point 0.3, they're still pretty poor health. Yeah, because societally speaking, a person who's at point 0.1 to point 0.2 yeah. will not be able to work in either case. Yeah. But someone who's at point 0.8 will be able to function better and contribute more to the society at, if, it, if, if yeah. he can function at point 0.9. Okay, that's interesting. I see your argument. Currently, the suggestion is the opposite direction. But... Um, Arguably, um, we could pay much more attention to the so productivity argument. And indeed, we'll maybe not in this one, but we'll come to productivity at some point, I think. Um, is it not more important to some people's health, if you like, is more important than others because of what they do with, with the health? Um, to the extent we have any evidence, there does seem, among the general population, there seems to be a, a bit of a preference 
for giving the benefit to the sicker person. I wouldn't overstate that, though. The evidence is a bit mixed. But I, 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 I take your point. I think it's interesting that you're seeing it the other way around. Um, when I come back to um, this bit, which I will return to, and we're talking about waiting just now, including a broader range of consequences, that's been one attempt to actually address the, the sort of productivity aspect and uh, the benefit of getting people back into work, for example, and we'll touch on that. Um, another example is, I can, I can know what you're going to suggest, but proximity to end of life, there's a suggestion that a quality gained by a patient who's uh, near the end of their life might be valued more highly than a quality to somebody who's not near the end of their life. And um, again, the evidence on this is quite mixed. There's been quite a few studies that have attempted to ask, if you like, the public about their preferences here. And I would say about a third of the studies support this idea that perhaps... The older people. <laughs> interestingly, quite often older people, when if you ask it in an age-based context, older people tend to favour giving benefits to the young, um, which is perhaps slightly against self-interest. But uh, And then about a third of the studies show nothing, and another third show the reverse. Don't, um, don't give the benefit to people near the end of life. Uh, this is a situation where in England, we actually do have something where we weight some qualities more highly, and it's for a particular patient group, uh, which I'll talk about later, but it's a subset of cancers. And these patients, we are required by the government to weight their benefit more highly. Uh, dread conditions. Some conditions are, are much more highly dreaded than others by society. Is that a reason to therefore value any health benefits that are in those conditions more highly? Another argument is what about rarity? Sometimes we talk about orphan conditions where the number of patients with that particular condition is very small, should we um, value benefits to these individuals more highly? The argument is a slightly twisted one. It's that because they're such a small patient group, it's going to be quite expensive to do anything for them. Um, the costs of drug development and so on are going to be very high relative to the number of potential patients who might gain. And so there tends to be less investment in these uh, orphan drugs. Again, if you ask the public, you get a range of answers. I find it quite hard to argue in an intellectual way that the rarity of somebody's condition should influence how much we're willing to spend. And the idea we should be willing to spend more of our limited resources on these patients than other patients. You could put it the other way around. Why should somebody with a common condition be treated differently? Why, why is benefit not important to them as important? Uh, another one is occupationally induced conditions. Some conditions are nothing to do with um, the choices the, pa the patient has made, but they happen to work in a particular industry and didn't realize that that industry was killing them. Good example of this is um, asbestos and industries that use asbestos. Uh, particularly, of course, for many years now, we've been aware that, uh, of the health problem. But there was a time when we were pretty ignorant about the potential health problems. And so there's a condition called mesothelioma, 
which you um, develop as a consequence of inhaling asbestos fibres. And uh, indeed, I, I remember a situation, I was on a committee in, uh, in the UK where we approved a drug called Pemetrexed for treating mesothelioma, although it was above the threshold, its cost effectiveness. And the argument was, these individuals were very unfortunate, there were no alternative treatments, and they had got their um, condition through occupational exposure. And they didn't, they didn't know that this was damaging them. So that was thought a reason for um, treating them differently. I won't go through everyone, but uh, we'll just touch on them lightly. What about self-inflicted conditions? Suppose your condition is one that is, in effect, your responsibility. Should we perhaps value quality gains in self-inflicted conditions less highly? Most obvious example here, um, while lung cancer is not just restricted to smokers, many forms of lung cancer are essentially diseases caused by smoking. Should we value benefits, health benefits to this group of smokers, or maybe ex-smokers, uh, differently? Or um, the other example always is obesity. Now, probably for an audience based in Japan, I probably need pictures to explain what I mean by obesity. Uh, but I guess you're familiar with the concept. Uh, some individuals, of course, um, appear to be grossly overweight, and that has consequences for their health. Uh, is that not their responsibility? Now, most governments have been very reluctant to go very far in this area of self-inflicted conditions. But increasingly in the health service, we do see, for example, surgeons being more restrictive about which patients they'll prioritise for surgery. Now, the argument is not that they're punishing the patient for their bad behaviour in the past. The argument is the um, benefits of surgery, perhaps, to the obese patient are um, less than the benefits. And so it's not a case of weighting the qualities, it's just a, it's an argument that the effectiveness of the intervention is different uh, depending on the obesity of the patient. Childhood. Nice in England find it very difficult to say no to things for children. I think many governments find it difficult. Should we value qualities for children more highly than qualities for adults? Well, there's arguments for and against. Um, what about health inequalities? What if, if uh, the patients are predominantly in a, a, a low or disadvantaged socioeconomic group? Should we value health benefits that we can give them should we value those more highly? And the, the one I really don't like, but it's called the rule of rescue. Now this is best illustrated when um, the lone yachtsman in the middle of the Pacific is sinking and we spend huge resources to try and find him or her. Uh, yachts man or yachts woman, and rescue them. That's where it comes from. But the idea is this. What about qualities for patients who are in imminent threat of severe health loss? Do we somehow, should we, we must do more for them? Because if we don't, uh, it's sort of catastrophic. Huge list there. Now, if you started embracing them all, it's not so much your weight in your qualities, your qualities are sort of fragmenting. You'd have a whole series of weights. To date, as I say, um, only 
Norway and actually Netherlands to a limited extent have brought in legislation that refers to severity of condition. England has this thing with respect to some cancer patients, end of life, what are called end of life, life extending treatments. Otherwise, officially, um, none of these are, um, are really written down too much. Uh, maybe the occupational health one is. There are instances where that is approved of. Yeah. So, as I said, I need to go a bit faster probably. Um, I'll come back now to this issue. That was waiting qualities. And I want to talk about trying to value a broader range of consequences. So the quality is measuring consequences of a health intervention. It's measuring something to do with change in survival and something to do with the health state the patient survives in. But there are other aspects of benefit that the quality is not capturing. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Um, I was pleased with that because I just put those action buttons in this morning before breakfast. <laughs> and I, of course, I should have done them later, another time. A couple of years ago, Department of Health in England came up with a proposal to measure the wider societal benefit. So uh, Department of Health are big supporters of cost per quality, but there's a recognition that maybe the quality is only capturing some part of the benefit of healthcare interventions, and there are um, wider societal benefits. And for uh, Department of Health's purposes, they've def defined wider societal benefit as the difference between um, production and consumption. And so you could call it perhaps net resource impact, but production and consumption. So the idea is this, patients, if you don't intervene, will have a particular level of production, uh, maybe zero of course, they're unable to work. Um, if you intervene, you will change the expected production. Now it's important here to stress that production is not being viewed narrowly as only paid labour, it's recognising that people also produce value um, through unpaid labour, most obviously um, in the household, but also through voluntary activities as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a broad notion of production. Okay, perhaps it's predominantly paid labour, labour market activity, but it's also going to include unpaid labour. And the idea being, that if we can make the patient, improve the patient's health, their production should increase. Patients are not only potential producers or actual producers, they are also consuming resources. Uh, they consume most obviously formal health care, but they also have informal care. Um, they consume government services. There's a list of things they consume. And so the idea being, if we return a patient to health, not only will we have an impact on their production, we'll probably have an impact on their consumption. And particularly, um, formal care will go down. And um, maybe the consumption of other government services might go down. And informal care might go down as well. Because one of the biggest sources of care for sick people is informal, family, neighbours, friends. And so perhaps you get, begin to get the idea here. Um, the quality, it's looking at survival, change of health state, doesn't capture any of this really. There's wider societal benefits that are missing and it, they could be summarised through this difference between production and consumption. Now, to operationalize it, 
um, they developed simple models that looked at four different characteristics, the age of the patient, the gender, um, the ICD code, in other words, which um, disease area was involved, and the final one represented here by Q, quality of life. And so for example, and I won't go through it blow by blow, um, they argued the amount of formal care consumed by the patient was particularly driven by their age and their health state or quality of life. Um, their labour market activity was largely explained by age, gender and again the quality of life. So this, to some extent, was addressing the issue that you were raising, that, well, if we now look at somebody who's very ill, and we might move them from point one to point two, actually, we probably won't change their consumption. We won't change their production. So there's no additional benefit from treating them. But if instead we have a patient who's at point eight and we move them to point nine, that is quite likely uh, to affect possibly paid labour, possibly unpaid labour, and also may lead to reduction in some of these areas of consumption. And so the Department of Health, you'll be glad to know in England, was thinking along the lines that you were suggesting, that actually um, weight and qualities, and by severity, that's one thing, but there's something missing and these are um, best captured by this net resource impact. Subsequently, we didn't change our system. We had a consultation on it, and um, there were very mixed views. Basically, for many years, patients had been saying, um, you know, it's terrible that we aren't really including informal care and things like that. Um, but then, they, this came as a package and they got a bit, patient groups got a bit scared of the idea that whether somebody worked or not um, might be influential in whether or not a treatment was going to be available. Now it wasn't that we'll treat you if you work, but it's, it was more people with your type of condition, if we treat you, Will we typically see increased production, increased work, or will we not see increased work? So it wasn't personalised to individuals, it was to the patient group. And so while patient groups had been quite active wanting to go beyond the quality and to try and capture wider benefits, things like um, the care that informal carers were giving, and if you could reduce that, that's a benefit. While they liked that element, they didn't like the, the focus on paid, paid, paid labour. Right. Um, yeah, actually I've covered cost effectiveness and, and affordability as we went along. Okay, so for the last 15 minutes, um, I'll uh, give you a flavour of some of the organisations and some of the sorts of um, activities that have been going on in the UK using cost effectiveness information. So, um, NICE, first of all, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, they, over the years, um, been in existence since about 1999, over the years, their remit has expanded and expanded. Their resources have gone down and down, but uh, that's called productivity increase. And they do a huge amount of activity. Uh, you might have come across clinical guidelines they produce. Um, the area that's of perhaps most relevance here is what's called technology appraisal. And this is decision-making around new health technologies, predominantly new drugs. Essentially, 
what NICE is doing with respect to assessing new drugs is reviewing clinical and economic evidence. And the issue is this, how well does the new medicine work? And given how well it works, and given the price we're being asked to pay, how good value for money is it? So first of all, does the evidence suggest it's effective? And then second, given the cost to us of the, the new drug, is it good value for money? So NICE Appraisal Committee um, makes recommendations on these new technologies. It has two categories of guidance. It either recommends or it says not recommended. If it recommends, it recommends exactly what or for whom and when. So for example, um, it may, in approving a new drug, it may restrict the patient group or it may introduce a stopping rule that this new drug will be available uh, for six courses of treatment, but then no more. The health professionals in England are expected to take nice guidance into account when exercising their clinical judgment. Now, all that means is health professionals can do what they like. And as long as other health professionals, their peer group, don't think the behavior is strange, they're fine. On the other hand, for the NHS as an organization, a NICE positive recommendation is mandatory. So if NICE recommend a new drug or a new therapeutic approach, the NHS in England must make that available normally within three months. Individual clinicians can do what they like, but the system has to um, make the treatment available. NICE has a threshold, and it's been quite explicit that its threshold is a range, and the range is 20,000 to 30,000 pounds per quality. And it's had this threshold range since 2004, hasn't um, changed it, although I think it's fair to say at the start, near 2004, committees were tending to think of the bottom end of the threshold range, 20,000, whereas in the last few years, in effect, the threshold is 30,000. So while the threshold hasn't changed over time, the point where we put greatest emphasis has maybe shifted so it is equivalent, perhaps, to the threshold rising slightly over time. There's a recognition, explicit recognition, that the quality may not fully capture the health benefits. And that's one reason why committees might be willing to pay a bit more than the threshold value. The other situation is where the evidence is a bit poorer and the uncertainties are greater, in that sort of situation, perhaps um, a committee will be less likely to recommend a particular technology at any particular cost, cost threshold. And this element here, this last one, is this example I mentioned with respect to cancer. Um, there's something called supplementary guidance for life-extending end-of-life treatments, uh, which was introduced in 2009. And they've revised the criteria a few times, but currently there's two criteria to be fulfilled. The treatment is indicated for patients with a short life expectancy. That's less than 24 months. And there's sufficient evidence to suggest that, um, on average, patients could gain three months of life. So, short life expectancy for the patient group, under two years, under 24 months, and evidence of potential health gain 
of an average of three months. And if those two criteria are met, uh, the qualities are valued more highly and the 50 decisions so far that met these criteria have used a cost effectiveness threshold equivalent to £50,000 per quality. Now, every example of a short life expectancy less than 24 months and an expected gain of three months, every example has been a cancer therapy. But it's not all cancers, it's cancer therapy near the end of life. And so it's an example of just the opposite of what you're suggesting that you might favour or might expect. And that is this group of patients who are particularly ill, uh, we're valuing benefits to them more highly than all other patients. The idea that's put forward is, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a very limited life expectancy, very limited life expectancy, that extra little bit of time to sort of put your life affairs in order, or you survive to see the baptism of a grandchild, or you see somebody marry, or whatever. These are the sorts of things that are put forward, um, are particularly important. And I'm not going to argue they're not, but every other patient group who don't meet these criteria, they also have things that are important to them. Um, so I think it's quite, it's quite a strong judgment to say that this group deserve more. Um, it all came about because of politics, you won't be surprised. Uh, I haven't got time to go into the story for that, so I'll have to leave that. Okay, um, Scottish Medicine Consortium do something rather similar to um, NICE, but do it in Scotland. Uh, what's quite interesting about Scottish Medicine Consortium is that they explicitly came up with a list of what they've called modifiers and reasons for being willing to spend a bit more for a quality. And their modifiers, um, some of them, uh, I've listed here. So for example, if the drug you're looking at is a bridge to some uh, definitive therapy, for example, a bridge to transplant, so this drug keeps you alive or gets, makes you healthy enough to reach um, transplant, that might be uh, a reason for valuing a bit more highly. Uh, another inter quite interesting one here is sometimes the new drug will be replacing or an alternative to something that's unlicensed or is being used more strictly off-label. A drug might have a license, but not for this condition, a license for some other condition. And this is a real sort of pharmacologist's regulation type thing. They like the idea that the new drug has a license. The new drug has evidence and has then got approved, in our case, by something called the European Medicines Agency. And so it's going to replace an unlicensed, or strictly speaking, off-label therapy. Now, I don't think that's a very good reason for being willing to spend a bit more for a health benefit, but it, it's... It is used. Okay, um, National Screening Committee also use cost effectiveness information. National Screening Committee is a body set up to make decisions on screening programs. Uh, and they'll use cost effectiveness evidence. So in uh, England, or indeed UK, we screen for colorectal cancer. Not every country does. And we do it because the evidence suggests it's effective. And more than that, it suggests it's cost effective. So it has an influence. Uh, I'll leave that. Um, yes, I mentioned this um, 
as one of the activities I did for indeed eight years, I sat on this committee, the safety of blood, tissues and organs. And this committee explicitly considers cost effectiveness. But quite important to note, it doesn't just um, look at cost effectiveness, but it considers um, other arguments. For example, the need to maintain adequate supplies of blood products. And so when this committee was looking at different interventions, and here's some examples of interventions, um, pathogen in activation of platelets. So essentially you're making the blood product platelets uh, safer by in inactivating pathogens. Um, another example is instead of getting platelets from single donors, uh, the process is called apheresis. Um, instead of single donor apheresis, you can get the platelets from pooled whole blood donations. Now, uh, the pooled whole blood donation is cheaper, but riskier, because uh, you've got lots of individuals, as it were, contributing their, their risks to the pool. Whereas if you're getting your platelets from single donors, you can be very well, much more sure that that donor's platelets are uh, not so risky. Um, one quite recent one is screening for hepatitis E, H-E-V. Now again, all of these, we look at cost effectiveness as one of the main arguments. As a consequence, um, we didn't introduce pathogen inactivation of platelets. We did introduce screening of blood donation. Um, I think we said no to prior infiltration of red blood cells, I think, but we said yes to the importation of fresh frozen plasma to reduce the risk of variant CJD. Now, you can't see this. This is very irritating when any speaker says this, but you can maybe make it out on your handout. This is the sort of decision-making grid. The key point here is value for money is a consideration, but it's not the only consideration. Um, and so we explicitly look at other factors. JCVI, something similar. I'm conscious time has has left us. Um, this is Joint Committee on Vaccination Immunization. And again, cost effectiveness is an important consideration. Um, got an example. Um, not that bit. Menin meningococcal B vaccination. When we looked at the cost effectiveness of it, there was a pretty low price at which a programme of vaccinating infants would be cost effective. It was a fairly low price. On the other hand, when we looked at adolescents and giving them the vaccination, it, it wasn't possible um, to find a positive price at which it would be cost effective. And so the cost effectiveness was instrumental in deciding to introduce the vaccine, vaccine program for infants and to say no to adolescents. Now, let me stress, it's not that it doesn't work in adolescents, but it doesn't work well enough given the cost of the vaccine. And I won't go through these. I'll just get to my summary. Um, there are a number of challenges involved in using economic evaluation to inform decision making. Perhaps the biggest one is producing robust estimates of cost effectiveness. Now, I've rather blithely said 
we can compare the cost effectiveness estimate with the threshold. But to calculate the cost effectiveness, the cost per additional quality gained for these different interventions, it's not straightforward. And the evidence that we are avail is available to be used is frequently not very strong. And so, perhaps the biggest challenge, if you want to use economic evidence, is coming up with robust estimates of cost effectiveness. And the next lecture and lecture tomorrow morning are very much looking at some of these issues. Next challenge, well, this is one I started with, you have to decide on a cost effectiveness threshold. What represents good value? Now, I'm suggesting that you could look at the what gets displaced. It's a nice idea, but again, it's not the simplest task, identifying the value of what's displaced. And then, um, what other factors, other than cost effectiveness, should be included? And then the final challenge is this. Health economists love economic evaluation. It's to us, it's bread and butter. It's better than bread and butter. It's, uh, it's lifeblood. The rest of society, of course, is not quite as up for economic evaluation. And there's a wide range of stakeholders, patient groups, uh, pharmaceutical industry, clinicians, politicians, all these other groups really want a series of yes decisions. People don't like to hear, no, you're not going to get access to this technology. They don't like to hear that. And so the final challenge here is how do you say no sometimes and yes sometimes and keep stakeholders engaged? And that's a tricky task because you need the industry, you need clin clinician groups, you need patient groups to some extent to sort of buy into the system and to accept it. And indeed, you need your politicians to, um, to do so as well. So those are the challenges. And sorry for um, having to just overrun slightly, but I can blame the technical challenges at the start. Uh, OK, um, we'll have plenty of time for questions in other sessions, so I won't keep you from lunch and your well-earned lunch break. Uh, do we start again at one? One o'clock, yeah. And so just to remind you, what we're going to move on to is the, what's at the heart of many economic evaluations, and that is predicting what's going to happen to patients if we don't treat them or if we do treat them with the new technology. And it's that, that's the engine that drives most economic evaluations because the time patients spend in different health states will influence the costs and influence the benefits. Okay, thank you.